Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to the webinar on Ecological Farm Design by Helen Athau and Doug O'Brien. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm a coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and recorded webinars on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. A PDF handout of today's webinar slides is available at the link in your chat box. In this presentation, Helen and Doug will describe their experiences over 20 years at Pinnacle Farm in San Juan Bautista, California, and Biodesign Farm in Stevensville, Montana. They'll be discussing how they increase plant diversity and manage pests and vegetable crops with minimal or no spraying. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Helen Athau has been farming on her own and consulting for other organic vegetable and fruit farms for 25 years. She was a horticulture extension agent for 15 years and owned and operated Biodesign Farm, a 30-acre diverse organic fruit and vegetable farm in western Montana for 17 years. She recently spent six months as a consulting vegetable grower for a 2,000-acre organic vegetable and fruit farm in northern Colorado with a 5,000-member CSA. Doug O'Brien currently owns and operates Doug O'Brien Agricultural Consulting, providing on-site technical advice, field monitoring, and research for clients involved in fresh produce growing, harvesting, cooling, and marketing. He is an adjunct professor at Cabrillo College in Santa Cruz, California, and teaches classes in organic farming. After our 45-minute presentation, we'll have a 30-minute question and answer period. So now I'm going to hand over the screen controls to our first speaker, Doug O'Brien. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, about 22 years of visiting a particular vegetable farm two or three times per week. Uh, the farm I'm talking about is Pinnacle uh, Farm. Um, brand name is Pinnacle Organics. Uh, the actual farm name is um, Phil Foster Ranches. And um, I've visited for 22 years, two to three times a week, and um, have actually generated thousands of one-page reports. And from those reports today, I'm going to talk about some pest problems, what we've tried, and how things have changed. Um, so I think it's important to remember that all farms are unique, and our organic farms are particularly so. So what works on one farm doesn't necessarily work on another. So uh, we don't have a prescription for e for farms in general and have to develop our techniques as we go along. Of course, this is a challenge, but it also makes the job extremely interesting. So trying new ideas is key, but we want to base it on data and observation, on science, and then finally on hunches. And I think my overall goal today is to convince everyone to practice what I call the three ecological goals of good farm management, which are to maintain soil health, reduce off-farm inputs, and design your farm to reduce the risk of problems. So let's tar talk about a few of the things that go on at Phil's farms. Uh, the first one is cover crops and green manures. Um, for many years, uh, Phil did moderate cover cropping, and his organic matter started to climb. Then his organic matter in the soil was steady, and then finally it started to drop. With that, uh, Phil got real busy, and now we have a full-on, very extensive cover cropping program. The benefits of cover crop are, crops are too many to list. Most of you are probably well aware of what they are. Um, but one of the things that can be a problem with cover crops is they can encourage weeds. So, um, and certainly in the early years, that was apparent that weeds were perhaps setting seed in the cover crop and increasing the problems in the cash crops. So now Phil's switched to double seeding, so seeding twice as much as the usual recommended, and he started to weed the cover crops with tying weeders. And to make sure that the borders don't get weedy, he uses a mini disc to control the um, weeds at the edges of the field. And all those things have helped a great deal. Uh, soil organic matter, so that's really important at the farm. Um, and my question to you would be, why would you want to raise soil organic matter if you're just going to oxidize it away by bashing it with rototillers and other soil shattering machinery? And Phil feels that way too, so he uses uh, a spader which gently lifts and um, breaks up the soil without inverting it 
and without oxidizing a lot of organic matter. Uh, here's a close-up of the um, tines, which are really much like a shovel. Soil spaders are extremely slow, and so it takes quite a commitment to spend the time to spade, but it really does um, prevent you from losing your organic matter. And in warm climate soils like we have in California, that's really important. Let's see, um, Phil began with compost that he bought, but um, after a while uh, he decided to make his own and he grows it just like another crop and puts on 10 tons per acre per year. He uses the modified Lubke method. You can um, web search Lubke if you want to see what that is. But it really involves monitoring the carbon to nitrogen ratio the carbon dioxide levels with the idea of um, making sure you're not getting ammonia, temperature, and moisture. And whenever one of these exceeds guidelines, the uh, pile gets turned, so very frequent turning. He also adds clay soil to the compost to catch some of the nutrients on the clay surfaces. Um, and I think uh, we both think that um, if you're going to use compost tea, it's only going to be effective if you start with a high-quality compost. So uh, this is a major part of his soil building program. Um, gypsum and lime, so many farmers seem to neglect this, and it is so important for, again, too many reasons to list, which uh, you probably already know um, at least seven of them. Um, in the early years, Phil's use of gypsum was a bit sporadic, but now uh, he has a full-on program of spreading gypsum every year. Here's some of my students up at the college spreading gypsum. Okay, Phil likes to play, pay good wages, and he might not be able to do so if he had too much hand weeding. And so um, after a few years, he bought a flamer, uh, which burns the, well, it actually doesn't burn the leaves. It actually dehydrates them by uh, heating up the cells so they explode. But uh, Generally, it kills weeds when they're small on the surface of the soil. And at first, he was just using onions and garlic. But um, now he has a full-on program of stale seed bed uh, whenever he can fit it into the um, crop mix, which is pretty frequently now. And that has really reduced the amount of hand weeding that needs to be done. Now, in the early years of the ranches, um, just like most organic farmers in, the, in those times, we used pesticides for insects, and um, it really didn't work very well. We uh, gradually added um, annual beneficial plants. And here's some um, cilantro growing between cabbage and carrots. Um, now just about every crop on the ranch gets alyssum, cilantro, or dill, or a combination of the three, or two, or one, depending on the crop we're growing. Sometimes we grow it in rows, and sometimes it's interplanted. And again, that depends on the particular crop. Now here's a bunch of pest control methods that have been added over the years. The first one you'll see on the left are those tall plants, which are hedgerows, which is a mixture of perennials. And um, the mix is designed such that there are flowers um, in bloom somewhere in the hedgerow at all times of the year. And this, of course, uh, attracts beneficial insects. And the hedgerows, in my opinion, seem to have a real stabilizing effect on the farm. We seem to have fewer kind of out-of-nowhere insect infestations. Um, we do have a lot yet to learn about managing these hedgerows. Uh, birds and rodents seem to have increased. And that brings us to the next thing, which is that quail barrier, which is the fence right along the hedgerow there. Phil likes quail but they actually murder the crops that are close to the hedgerows. So um, if we have a barrier like this, quail don't like to fly, so that generally keep them within the hedgerows and they won't move out into the crop. Um, on the very far left top, or, or sorry, on the right, you'll see a row cover. Uh, this keeps the birds that like to go further in off, um, blackbirds and sparrows mainly. Uh, you also see on the far left we have an owl box, and they work really well. They always have all owls, but it seems like maintaining them doesn't get enough attention, and I'm not really sure why. Um, our lepidopteran pests, which are the worms, imported cabbage worm, loopers, armyworm, and lots of others. 
they seem to have really decreased, um, particularly after the hedgerows went in. We still actually see them just as often, so when I'm walking the fields, I still find my Lepidopteran pests, but at much lower numbers, and we have much higher thresholds now where we feel like we need to treat them with um, BT. And it is kind of ironic to me that the pest that's the easiest to control with organic pesticides, namely BT, is also the easiest to control biologically. Now there are are lots of insects that we don't have complete control over. One of the big ones are, is aphids, and particularly cabbage aphids. In the early years, um, we could lose several blocks in a row. Pesticides never worked for us. I think we started to make progress in a bunch of different ways. The first was timing the crops to avoid the worst times of the year. The only way you can find that out is to start growing them year-round, and we discovered the best seasons for each farm location. Phil has two locations which have different climates, and they actually have different times when the aphids are active. Um, we started the infield insectaries. We began to do compost tea on a regular schedule using a threshold for when we actually felt we needed the compost tea. Uh, the hedgerows were added. And then finally, we have a strict east to west block um, planting. Uh, which uses the prevailing wind. So we plant the first block in the east, the prevailing wind is from the west, so each succeeding block moves into the prevailing wind, which means that um, the aphids are blown into the older crop rather than into newer crop, and this seems to have helped quite a lot. Um, and so um, here's some uh, brassicas. We have uh, row cover for the turnips to prevent root maggots. It's really the only way we can grow turnips is to cover them before they even emerge with row covers. But anyway, the brassicas all move from east on the right hand of your screen to west, getting younger and younger as you move up the field. So now I would say the losses are tolerable, but we still have losses. And the beneficial organisms that we've seen increase um, are the parasitic wasps and surface fly larvae primarily. And I think that the Pandora entomopathic fungi are also pretty important from time to time when things get really out of control. Uh, here's another shot um, of uh, this east to west planting. So over the years, thresholds have become even more important because as each year goes by, we gather more and more data about things. And so uh, these thresholds have taken years to develop, but now we're at the point where they are really, really helpful. So I regularly report how many plants have a particular problem. I like to do 20 because that gives me a 5% chance of error. Um, here's uh, you know cutting broccoli in half, so I only have to look at a half of broccoli and then I can double what I see. I'm never really counting aphids. Um, it's more whether they have an infestation or not. That seems to be a better way to count aphids is just does the plant have it or doesn't it, rather than trying to count how many aphids there are on a plant, which could be 500. Now here's a couple of our toughest customers. Um, down in the bottom there, you'll see a spotted cucumber beetle. We have both the spotted and the striped. And then above it, um, you can see some septoria disease on the celery leaves. Let's talk about the cucumbers beetles first. Um, they have caused large losses. And although we've worked out ways to develop to deal with them, they do continue. Uh, we do too many things to list to discourage them. Some of them you know, may have a very minor effect, but we keep doing them. Uh, others we think are more important. Um, here's a few that we've done. Uh, we tried trap crops, but they basically failed because even though they were very good at attracting the cucumber beetles into them, we had no way to really kill the beetles properly once they arrived. Uh, Stricky traps failed. Um, that's pretty much the way it works for most people. Um, insect va vacuums help, but they really don't work for many cro crops, and they um, kill your beneficials along with your uh, cucumber beetles. Turns out that crop timing is, temp is, t is critical, but it's really of limited use, particularly in things like melons, where the time when we want to have melons and when we can have melons is the time when the cucumber beetles are pretty active. Um, the row covers work somewhat, but they really aren't appropriate for a lot of crops. Um, and then there are lots of other things. In the end, I think what we've gone to is lots of things, we've eliminated, but we have eliminated sensitive crops. There are the things we've just given up on. Um, 
And basically, if we try something several times and it fails each time, it's gone, and um, we eliminate it from the crop mix. For the septoria, basically, if the weather cooperates, we can control it with a bunch of different techniques. But if we get a really rainy period at the wrong time or our rains come early, um, we will take some losses. All right, uh, so here we are with our amaranth covered crop our trap crop for cucumber beetles looks great, but basically didn't work. Um, insect vacuum, I don't, they have their use, but you got to think of it as basically a broad spectrum insecticide, which is kind of um, against the principles of organic farming. Uh, hoop houses, um, started to do a lot of these in recent years. They're really great for extending our seasons, for increasing the diversity, but we're also extending our pests. So um, I expect more challenges as we um, continue with the hoop houses. So um, some diseases and some insects have been reduced, but some, such as powdery mildew and mites, have really increased. So let's talk about plant disease. Um, mostly in organic farming, people like to talk about insects because we have this great biological system that often takes care of them. Here's my take on it. After 22 years, I'm pretty much firmly convinced that we need to think of diseases and animal pests differently. The animal pests exist in the ecological world of predator and prey, of parasite and helper, and biological control is the key. But diseases, on the other hand, are nature's reboot button. Whenever there's too much of one genotype, bam, the disease takes over, regardless of ecology. And unfortunately for us, agriculture thrives on limited genetic diversity. So that leaves us with the weapons being pesticides, genetics, and exclusion. We can't exclude very many diseases that blow in from other places. They're already in our soils. Um, most organically acceptable pesticides haven't worked for us, so we're left with genetics. Um, and by this I mean resistant varieties. But as long as we have effective non-organic pesticides that most growers can use and a tiny organic industry, we aren't going to get the genetics we need from seed companies. So we have to drop the crop. And some examples of this uh, are spinach, which we no longer grow, and cucumbers, which we've, which we've more or less eliminated from the late season, both of those because of downy mildew. Well, it's not all hopeless, I mean, in diseases. There are tons of cultural techniques we develop for individual crops that reduce our risk of problems. Our disease losses really have decreased, so we are doing many things right. Um, pink root and onions, for example, it's not clear why we're making progress, but we are. Perhaps it's just our ever-increasing soil health. Now, I've become obsessed with design lately to reduce the risk of problems. Honest mistakes are fine, but making a mistake because you never thought something through is perhaps less forgivable. Why didn't I know that a hoop house would be like an additional, additional hedgerow to provide cover for birds? Well, because I never thought of it. Here's another one. Um, the carrots planted next to broccoli. The white crowned sparrows live in the broccoli, and they do a great job of eating all kinds of things in there. But then they come out, and they use it for cover to eat the carrots. So, to sum up, uh, observe, measure, record, think about what you've seen, and experiment. And play, pay special attention to the big three things. So, uh, maintaining your soil health, reducing off-farm inputs, and practicing good design. Okay, I think it's my turn now. And, uh, Basically, my farm in Montana is much colder and much drier, and I think that I have much fewer uh, pests as a result than the farm we've just been hearing about. Still, though, what I do is pretty much uh, the same. My basic goal is to have a farm design that increases plant diversity. So we have li living mulches, or legume living mulches, in between the crop rows, and we have perennial grass beetle banks, and we have insectaries with perennial native flowers, and hedgerows, much like the ones Doug showed us, with woody plants, shrubs, and trees. 
And basically, the soil is covered all season, and we're working on a reduced tillage system as well. And that's covered now with a, a legume living mulch. And here's the next picture I wanted to show you. So for about 12 years, we did this living mulch reduced tillage system. And we spent that 12 years kind of trying to tweak all the interrelationships, all the ecological interrelationships that were going on, and learned a lot about this system. One of the things that we found is that the living mulch system in our dry climate is quite water intensive. We need to irrigate quite a bit for it. However, over the uh, 12 years, over actually the 17 years of the farm, we've seen steady increases in soil organic matter, then a bit of a leveling out. And hence, we've had to use less irrigation because the soil organic matter has increased. And as you can see, one of the tweaking things we've done is to leave some of our crop residue in there and let it flower for um, more habitat for beneficials, kind of for free. So in this tweaking out of the ecological relationships, we've learned an awful lot. We've learned what we have to pay attention to, the kind of thing Doug was just talking about. And we've developed what we call competition thresholds and also focused on crop timing in relation to all the other things that we're adding to all the rest of the diversity that we're adding to the system. And so for example, we found that we've got to think about all of these things at once when we put in a crop. So for example, onion transplants compete very well with our all psych white clover as long as we have a very high fertility system and we're irrigating so that the crop and the living mulch get enough of the nutrients and the water that they need. So we're always thinking about all of these interactions when we, uh, when we add our design biodiversity to our cropping system. And in fact, we've found that uh, things that we start out doing, we change almost on a regular dynamic base basis. So for example, we started out with a living mulch system in which we tilled in the clover every, every spring and then planted a new living mulch. And then we started learning to leave islands of untilled in clover every year, such as this yellow sweet clover that you're seeing, that then the next year would bloom for us and provide even more habitat for beneficial insects in right in the field. And as a lucky little added benefit, we got wind protection from it for some of our early transplants. And what this showed us is that over time, we saw increased predator and parasite activity. And as Doug has done, I have monitored them. Uh, I could show you lots of data, but this is one of my favorite photos, turning up um, a pepper leaf and looking underneath it and seeing both a parasitized aphid and a predator fly larva. So I know that, uh, I know that we have everybody working and doing their jobs. We also have um, begun to see new predators entering our system. And this is kind of ironic, uh, because we just heard about the birds being a problem in, in Doug's system. And certain birds are indeed a problem in my system, too, as I'll talk about later. But some of the birds that have moved into the system, like these wonderful bluebirds that are munching on uh, imported cabbage worms, are, are, are taking out uh, insects for us. We have. Uh, also found that as we left the crops in the field, so our later broccoli we would leave in, and it would flower and provide habitat for uh, wasp parasites and other insects. And then we would leave the broccoli to go to seed, and things like chipping sparrows would move in. And we found that uh, they were at least not doing any damage. We, we haven't uh, figured out exactly what, uh, what other benefit they may or may not be allowing uh, for our system. And as you can see, uh, looking at this cabbage, uh, just like the slide that Doug showed us, there are still some holes in the outside of those leaves. We definitely still have what is a major problem in our valley, uh, which is uh, imported cabbage worm. But we just don't see as much damage uh, over the uh, over the years that we've been doing this uh, living mulch system. So we're counting 
but we don't have to spray any Bt, uh, which has been very nice. We also began to see new predators moving into our system as we increased all these ecological interrelationships. And I want to stop and say here, too, that uh, we don't have a lot of vegetable production directly around us. The one thing we do have is potato production. Mostly what we have is, uh, is livestock uh, ranching uh, as our neighbors. Uh, but we did have Colorado potato beetle because traditionally there have been a lot of potatoes grown in our valley. And so we did have to treat for Colorado potato beetle. But about, uh, oh, I guess about eight years ago, uh, this little guy moved in, a predaceous stink bug. And uh, within a few years, we stopped uh, spraying for Colorado potato beetle as well. In fact, we got to the point where by about uh, 2002, 2003, we stopped spraying anything. The other nice thing that we found is that uh, when we did some um, exclosure studies where we put things on our tomato plants so that the uh, insects couldn't get to them, uh, we found that we had increased habitat for pollinators and we were, in getting, we were getting increased fruit set as well, another added little benefit. So we know that we've created habitat for insects and for birds and those interrelationships keep happening. What we found is that we got another little guy that we weren't quite so happy with. We got voles, and they suddenly, about uh, about uh, 2000, became one of our major predator, or excuse me, our major pests. And in fact, we had uh, pretty severe damage on uh, uh, squash and peppers, uh, particularly. So we had to learn what to do with those guys. And one of the things that we did was to actually manage the residue in the system. So we kept the, uh, the living mulch mowed much more, uh, much more stringently so that the, uh, the voles didn't have quite as nice habitat to, uh, to feel safe in. In 2004, we decided to even increase our farm design thoughts and ideas uh, more so, and we moved to a new field, a new six-acre field that had been in pasture for about 50 years. And we had this new area with all these ideas, and we wanted to try uh, a bunch of new things. So we uh, did some minimum tillage and seeded it to a permanent red clover. And then uh, we had the whole perimeter was left in the perennial pasture grasses, and we also left a uh, 30 by 600 foot row of uh, what we call our control, our pasture control. So that was not tilled ever. And it also had the added benefit of becoming uh, an infield beetle bank. On uh, one side of the field, besides the grass, perennial grass, uh, we also put in a 600 foot native plant hedgerow with flowering uh, perennial sunflowers and elderberries and uh, many other species of plants that uh, the birds would like as well. So we took all that lovely red clover and left it to permanent row middles. Instead of tilling every year the, the legume living mulch in, we just left that as a permanent habitat, uh, which became quite challenging with equipment. And I must say, uh, there was some bad language when I made beds, because it was hard to deal with all of that residue. Instead of putting compost over the whole field and tilling it in, we started putting compost only in row strips. And in fact, we had stopped using compost in the other field because the soil fertility had gotten so high. And we had uh, decided to stop utilizing manure. And in this field, we, we, because it was a new field, we decided to use the compost-based manure, but much less of it. So it saved us labor as well. Then, where we had put the, uh, the compost down, we went in with a single shank chisel plow and basically went up and down and just disturbed that clover. And of course, we did not get rid of that clover, I can tell you for sure. We also went through and rototilled it, thinking that we would set it back uh, even more. 
uh, but uh, the clover is uh, very able to handle itself, and it came right back. And so most of what we ended up learning in, in this new field was how to time and manage the perennial clover row middles. The wonderful thing was that we had even less bare soil than we'd had when we had tilled in the legume living mulch every spring. And the row middles were covered all year. And we had even more habitat for all kinds of other beneficial insects. So our perennial row middles and our insectaries, which is our, uh, there's a photograph on the top of one of our insectaries with the uh, perennial and some annual uh, native plants and some non-native plants. We managed to get earlier and increased numbers of predators and parasites in this new field than even than we had had in the old field, uh, which we thought was pretty good. And uh, we continued with our no spraying. And then, as these ecological systems evolved, we found that our main problem, the voles, had a new predator. So we had a predator that had never moved into our system. We had coyotes uh, moving into <laughs> our vegetable system. And in that bottom picture, you can see what we did for the voles and the birds, which became our main, our main problems. We have bird netting over the tomatoes, because we had both quail and um, oh, I can't think of the name of the big bird now, the big non-native bird uh, that comes in, and uh, they would peck at the tomatoes and ruin uh, uh, a percentage of our beautiful tomatoes. And that coyote you can see right next to the tomatoes has a vole in his mouth. So I'm not saying that the coyotes completely controlled the voles. They did not at all. Uh, but it was a wonderful thing to see that, uh, that the system continued to correct itself, so to speak. And we wanted to know more about that system. We wanted to figure out what was really going on. We wanted to get some scientific data. So in 2006, we received a SARE grant to study the imported cabbage worm. We had been taking, we'd been taking data on our long-term weed and soil fertility, but we wanted to really look closely. And we got a graduate student, because we had money to pay him, to uh, spend uh, 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 quite a bit of time uh, working on this study. And what we did was we compared the farm design itself, the unsprayed, the unsprayed uh, system, basically, to uh, uh, something that was sprayed bi-monthly with pyro uh, uh, rotenone pyrethrum. And the reason we used rotenone pyrethrum is because it is a very broad spe spectrum insecticide. And our, our thought was that it would kill our predators, and we would see what the system looked like without the added benefit of the predators. And of course, it is uh, certified organic, so we wouldn't have had any problem there. And then we also had our third treatment was to use uh, the no Pacific Northwest thresholds for imported cabbage worm and spray BT every time we were at a threshold. So we had the, uh, the farm design basically on trial, the rotenone pyrethrum killing the predators, and then we had uh, a, a threshold treatment with the uh, BT. And we were very surprised with what we found. First of all, we found very little parasitism. In the literature, it looked like imported cabbage worm was mainly controlled by uh, a specific parasite. And in all of the larvae that we collected and raised, we found very little parasitism. What we did find is that our main beneficials, are the guys that were doing all the work, was a generalist complex over the entire season, a complex that changed of, of predators. And then the other thing that we found, uh, which we weren't too surprised uh, by, but the data was just so clear, is that every time we sprayed the rotenone pyrethrin, look at that graph on the bottom, every time we sprayed, we saw a decrease in predators. And in fact, over the season, we managed to almost entirely lose where we sprayed the rotenone pyrethrin, ladybug spiders, and surfeit flies. So that uh, was a little, bit, uh, a little bit surprising to us. 
We also looked at the BT. The graph on the top is the BT. The graph on the bottom is the Roman and pyrethrin. And the uh, BT was much better. So a selective insecticide obviously is not going to kill the predators in the same way that uh, a general uh, organic insecticide will which we all knew, but it was kind of interesting to see that so clearly with our data over the entire summer. We also looked at ground-dwelling uh, predators with uh, our pitfall traps, and we found basically the same thing, that uh, the rotenone pyrethrin uh, killed off the spiders and the carabid beetles, and that we uh, saw more in our, our system where we didn't spray. And these guys could be important not just as predators of insects, but there is uh, some good data out there that carotid beetles may be very important in uh, removing weed seeds from a system, too. And we'll talk about weeds in a minute here. So uh, this was all exciting to see that our system, indeed, with all of our enhanced beneficial uh, or um, biodiversity, increased beneficial insects. but. Bottom line, what, uh, what really happened to the crop? And again, this data was really interesting as well. Where we sprayed BT, we had the lowest amount of foliar damage and the lowest amount of damage to our actual crop, to our Brussels sprouts. And in fact, we had really clean crop. We had 97% marketable crop. And I think my student was a little harder on uh, what he would and would not take to farmer's market than uh, this farmer would have been. We'll put it that way. In the unsprayed control in our system uh, comparison, basically, we had 88% marketable. And then what was really surprising is where we sprayed the rotenone pyrethrin, not only did we kill predators, but we didn't even get very good kill of the ultimate pest, and we only had 80% marketable. So this basically was enough for me to say, well, uh, we will definitely stick with our system because our system basically required no labor to, to, uh, to spray the insecticides and no, uh, no material cost. We also did a weed study. And I have to say, the data in our weed study was not as clear cut. <laughs> We're still trying to figure out. What, uh, what all we saw from the long-term study and from the study in 2007. This was an Organic Farming Research Foundation uh, funded study. And uh, we were asking ourselves some difficult questions. Basically, we already had no-till in the row middles. But what about in the crop row? What could we get away with? How little could we till and still have a good yield? Well, we found that. With no till, we had absolutely the lowest yield. But uh, the minimum till, uh, and I have to say, in this experiment, we pushed the limits a little bit more than uh, we normally would when I try to produce a crop. We uh, not only we just went in and did the uh, chisel plowing. We didn't go in the second time with the rototilling. So the minimum till here was uh, not as much tillage as we would normally do in our minimum tillage system. However, there was no statistical difference between minimum till and no-till. Our yields were low. Our biomass and our yields were low. They were better where we did uh, basically uh, regular weeding, as most uh, conventional organic farmers do, keeping the, the row uh, quite clean of weeds, where we had a paper mulch and where we, anytime weeds came up, uh, we sprayed uh, vinegar on them. So those were the comparisons in our, our uh, weed study. We also looked at uh, a long-term monitoring of where the weeds came from. We had that wonderful uh, beetle bank or control block of the 50-year-old pasture. And so we were able to see what weeds were there and where, where actually uh, they might have come from. And what we found out, uh, not surprisingly, is that they came from our manure-based compost and from soil disturbance. And uh, we uh, had used the Lubke method. Uh, we are not uh, as uh, 
vigorous in our turning and our monitoring of temperatures as uh, Phil Foster's farm is, but we uh, we kept our got our temperatures pretty high. So I was a little surprised to see that in this pot culture study that we had um, uh, so many annual weeds in uh, coming from our compost. And we looked more closely at just what kind of weeds uh, moved into the system. With the increased tillage and the compost, we saw more annual weeds moving in. So in the untilled control in the pasture that had been uh, kept in pasture for 50 years, basically we saw pretty much all, all perennial weeds and a, and a few biennials. Anytime we did any tillage at all, we uh, increased our, uh, our annual weeds. And of course, then in our compost pots, we had totally annual weeds and no perennials at all. So we saw a change in weed species composition based on our management techniques, which didn't surprise us, but uh, was a lesson in as to what we do and the impacts it has. So we saw basically a general increase in small seeded annuals and an increase in our low-growing uh, biennials and grasses. One uh, that you can see in this picture is uh, uh, common mallow or malva neglecta that loves the same habitat as our living mulch and uh, became quite, uh, quite prevalent, particularly in our, our system where we tilled every year. Uh, we didn't see it quite as much in the system where we kept, uh, kept a perennial uh, row middle. And I used to get really upset about that. And then one uh, year, I looked up what the nutrient uh, content of that common mallow was. And I realized it was adding uh, as much to the soil in many ways as my clover mulches. So I began to rethink uh, that problem. In our weed study, we also looked at uh, soil quality as well. And in our different treatments, our, uh, our no-till, minimum till, uh, tillage and vinegar and paper, we also looked at mycorrhizae fungi. And uh, I was a little disappointed to find out that um, there was no difference uh, between tillage and minimum tillage. The only difference we saw is where we did no till. So in other words, any time we did any kind of tillage or weed cultivation, we lost our mycorrhizae fungi. So that was uh, kind of disappointing. I'd hoped that we'd see a little better response with minimum tillage. We also looked at the relationship between nitrogen level and weeds. And uh, we weren't able to really figure this out quite yet. We did see that the Tilden three-year-old red clover uh, gave us an immediate release of nitrate nitrogen, which was something actually that I was trying for after being an organic farmer or, and working with organic farmers for 30 years. One of our problems had been not enough early nitrate nitrogen and slower crops getting to market. So that was something I always thought I wanted. As I look at the relationship between nitrate level and weeds, I'm rethinking that a little bit, but don't have any conclusions yet. So hopefully someone else We'll, uh, we'll have some ideas and some conclusions. What I can say in conclusion about our weeding portion of the system is that we do very well with transplants, but that seeded crops like lettuce do require a lot of hand weeding some years, uh, in fact, most years. And they do better with uh, annual clovers, like bursium clover, than perennial clovers, uh, like uh, alsike and white clover. and uh, uh, quite problematic with our very aggressive red clover, as uh, any idiot probably would have known. And we probably shouldn't have used red clover in our, uh, in our uh, second field. Uh, but we did. And we learned to live with it, <laughs> as uh, many of us farmers learn to live with things. So I want to talk briefly about diseases, because in the literature, of course, there is quite a bit of discussion about beneficial microbes and thoughts that improving habitat, such as living mulches, will increase beneficial microbes. And I want to say that because Doug is here and he's one of those very rigorous plant pathologists, 
I'm not going to make a direct correlation, and I put in lots of question marks, you can see. But I do believe that we are seeing a bit of a response to uh, disease suppression because we're increasing our, our beneficial soil microbes. And in fact, in 1995 and 1996, we did a SARE study, uh, and we looked at tillage and our, our mowing and leaving residue on the surface uh, living mulch system. And we found that the tillage decreased soil organic matter, earthworm, and uh, total microbe populations. We looked at uh, total microbial biomass using um, uh, an extraction, uh, chloroform extraction method. And indeed, uh, where we mowed, the treatments that we mowed and left the residue on, we had higher total microbial biomass. So we did have that data, but we are, have not been able, of course, to correlate it with actual disease, except perhaps in 2004, we think, notice Doug, lots of question marks, we think that we saw some disease suppression. We, uh, we haven't had very much disease at all in the system, uh, and virtually none for the last uh, five or six years of the, uh, of the farm's existence. But in 2004, we did see uh, cucumber mosaic virus in our pepper planting. And I got really upset early in the season, thinking, oh my goodness, it's going to be terrible because cucumber mosaic virus can be very problematic uh, when it gets established in a field. However, our yields were, uh, if anything, uh, better that year, but certainly not at all uh, diminished. And we didn't see uh, stunted plants. So we don't have any data that our system is uh, uh, decreasing uh, disease. Uh, but as we do with, uh, we think, with our insect results. But over time, from 1992 through 2011, we've seen generally improved yield and quality, fewer insects, and virtually no disease, and decreased labor uh, from the system. I do want to say that once we move to the uh, perennial uh, legume living mulch, row middles, our yields were not quite as good as where we did the minimum tillage and tilled in the, uh, the living mulch every season. Uh, and some of that uh, could be weed competition, or, or in this case, vegetation competition. And some of it could be uh, uh, that we're not adding as much, um, uh, we're, we're just not adding as much cover crop or green manure to the system. Uh, but we did see a slightly uh, a slight decrease in yield. But our yields are still excellent, I, I might add. So that is basically the system that uh, I want to talk about today. And now we can open it up to questions. I wanted to add one final thing and say that uh, uh, now I'm looking at even uh, more interesting uh, uh, directions and this talk about ecological interrelationships has pushed me into thinking about uh, veganic permaculture and you can go to my website and see what I'm up to now and you can see videos of the uh, the ecological work we did with the uh, no-till row middles and uh, the old field uh, stuff as well so thanks very much I bet we have questions um. Well, Doug has been typing in some question answers that we've gotten already, but um, here's one. Um, can okay? How are cover crops incorporated into planting beds without tilling? If somebody could answer that question, you're both online. So. Hmm? Doug, do you, you want to go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So the question was, the question was, how can uh, cover crops be incorporated without tillage? Did I get yeah. that right? That was the question. Yeah. Ooh, well, that's what I'm trying to figure out now uh, with the uh, veganic permaculture stuff. So in my, my new plot, basically, we're doing a lot of mulching. Uh, so we're, in Montana, I can get away with it because we have dry. So as soon as I uh, take away the water, um, uh, I, can, I can kill off cover crops. And then uh, with lots and lots of mulching, we uh, played with mowing uh, vigorously uh, on my farm. 
And uh, it would certainly set them back. I didn't show you photographs this time, but if you go to uh, um, the archive of the uh, webinar I did on reduced tillage, we talked about uh, flaming um, our cover crop. And uh, you can see uh, how that worked with red clover, which was not particularly well. I think it would work better with, uh, with some annual uh, clovers. And then, of course, uh, the roller crimper is what they're using in, uh, in the East Coast. It hasn't been uh, real effective on a lot of the clovers that I've worked with, although uh, I think, uh, Doug, you might remember, uh, I think there's uh, been some pretty good, uh, pretty good results uh, rolling and crimping uh, crimson clover. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, it's not that sort of thing doesn't seem very appropriate under California conditions. And a lot of it seems to have to do with the cost of our ground, at least for vegetable production. Um, we simply can't afford any loss of time between cover crop and planting um, because of high rents. And that really seems to kind of limit what we can do as far as not incorporating cover crops. Mm. OK, yeah, thank you. We've gotten several questions about that. Um, Here's another one about quail fencing. Um, could you please give details of the quail fence, um, the height, cost, and where you might get it? Um, I don't know exactly where to get it, and I don't know what it really costs. It must be reasonably priced. But um, it really just needs to be high enough that they don't jump up and see over it. And um, it needs to have a fairly fine mesh so that, uh, again, they see it as a real barrier and just give up. Um, I would guess, you know, three or four feet is plenty high. Uh, and, of course, if you have short rows, they'll run around the end of it. So, um, you know, you do get quail damage at the ends of the beds. Okay, here's a question about paper mulch, whether you have any experience with that. Um, the uh, caller, the um, listener said he thought that he saw plastic mulch, so he was interested more about if you have any experience with paper mulch. Uh, I can answer that because that was the uh, that was one of the treatments in our weed study, and we really liked uh, the paper mulch. Uh, we had a little trouble getting it down with our equipment, uh, but the the paper mulch that we used is eco cover, and uh, it uh, it was very able to handle uh, overhead irrigation. And uh, I think you saw that in my study, we had the highest yield. Uh, when we use the uh, eco cover paper mulch. Okay, um, here's a question about irrigation. Um, I guess um, one person wanted to know whether you irrigate your tomatoes or you do them in sort of a dry farming system or whether you have any experience in dry land farming. Is that Doug or me? Um, well, I don't know. I think uh, I think this is, well, I think the first one was for Helen about your tomatoes, but I guess either of you can chime in. Uh, I'll say that uh, I started doing uh, drip irrigation uh, on my tomatoes for the first uh, probably 10, 10 or 12 years of my operation. Um, and then I had this kind of strange uh, situation that uh, you know I had to pay electricity and uh, use uh, uh, electricity to uh, get drip irrigation to my to my tomatoes, but I had this uh, lovely gravity flow system uh, for overhead sprinkler, so I started using overhead uh, irrigation uh, for my tomatoes, which also then irrigated my cover crop in the row middle. Uh, so uh, that's basically what I've done. Um, I've tried uh, a little bit of, um, of um, dry land uh, 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 tomato production, although you can't really get away with it in Montana. It, it basically uh, didn't didn't rain uh, for for two and a half three months, um, which is why we don't have as many disease problems, I think, as as Doug has. But um, uh, we could minimize as we increased our soil organic matter uh, significantly, and particularly where we stopped doing tillage. Uh, it was amazing uh, how little water we could get away with, but we couldn't go to uh, uh, zero water. OK. Um, we had a question about whether your system incorporates the use of bees for added pollination to increase yield. Yeah, I can answer that one, certainly. Um, 
we use a lot of bees at fills. We've got a lot of crops that need pollination. And um, bee people are very happy to have their hives located at organic farms where there's a wide diversity and lots of different things flowering at once. So yeah, they're very important. So, so, Doug, you actually um, have have hives brought in? Phil does have hives come in every year, yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't, um, but I, uh, you, you saw that, uh, that the results of that data from where we did, when we did the uh, exclosure studies. We have so many native bees and, and, and naturalized bees that sometimes I would walk through the flowering broccoli and get stung. Uh, and I have wonderful photographs of uh, some of our our native bees in the uh, in the native plant uh, hedgerows. So uh, we created habitat, and they came. Um, but it's interesting to hear that uh, Phil brings them in. Okay, um, we have a question on whether either of you have looked at subterranean clover as a living mulch. Yeah, I love subterranean clover. I uh, I did my graduate work at Rutgers University where they've done a lot of work on on subterranean clover and uh, I really like it. I also got to use it uh, when I worked at uh, University of Arkansas and it was wonderful in orchard systems. Uh, in Montana, uh, I'll just say, and then I bet Doug has some comments, uh, there was only one variety, um, Mount Barker, that uh, was uh, was hardy enough to get by, and then some years it wouldn't do it. It, it wasn't consistent for me, but but I love that plant. <laughs> yeah, you know, in California, um, on organic vegetable farms, slugs and snails are a big problem, and a lot of these living mulch ideas generally fail almost immediately because of uh, the slugs and snails, and I think a lot of growers don't really want to be out there putting out um, the pesticides that control them, um, you know, on a weekly basis. So we really have kind of hit a wall on using living mulches, um, at least in the vegetable systems I'm familiar with. Wow, that's good to know, Doug. You haven't told me that. Okay, um, here's a question for Helen. Um, it, it refers to your 2006 SARE grant. Um, the listener wanted to know um, a little bit more about it, what the size and separation of each treatment was and how large the area was that was sampled and how many replicates. If you could go into a little more detail about that or maybe tell us where we could find information about that. Yeah, uh, actually, if I could get that person's email, I will send them uh, was that the insect study or the weed study? I'm sorry, which which one would they? Okay, want? it doesn't say. So the um, 2006. I think that was the insect study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, if you uh, send me the, your email and I will send you the uh, reports which go into uh, ridiculous detail on on all of that. Um, I, I'll send you both reports or or just the one, whatever you want. Uh, send email and I will I will send reports. I do need to say uh, from my last webinar. Uh, people asked for the 9596 uh, study, and I'm embarrassed to say that when I left the extension service, I uh, either deleted or somehow I have misplaced uh, that final report. So I do not have a copy of that final report, but I have the 2006 2007 report. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question again about um, cover crop mowing. Um, the listener didn't quite understand which one worked the best for best yields. Um, did you decide that annual minimal tilling worked best in the end? Uh, it, it wasn't a huge, huge difference, uh, but the yields, the absolute best yields, were when we um, when we. Uh, left the cover crop, so uh, let me just go through how we would do it. So we would seed the cover crop in the spring. Uh, after we made the beds, we'd seed the cover crop in between the rows. And then uh, we'd leave them on, uh, leave them obviously to grow all summer, leave them through the fall, through the winter, and then in the spring, we would till them in. Um, and that gave us just these ridiculously high yields. We were picking about 50,000 pounds of tomatoes per acre uh, in Montana, which is a very short short season. So those were really high yields. The, the yields in the other system were only slightly lower. They just, they, but they were a little lower. Did I answer that question? I think so. I hope so. If the questioner has any more questions, please um, feel free to type more in. 
Um, here's a question about using vinegar to control beads. How much do you use and how do you apply it? Doug, you want to do that? Um, I've never used vinegar to control weeds, so I have um, Doug, idea. we're not hearing you quite as well. If you could maybe put the microphone on a little bit closer. Okay. Um, is, is that okay. a little better? Yeah. Yeah, I've never used vinegar. Um, uh, as they say, uh, at Phil's, the flamer is the thing that seems to work the best, and for smaller growers, even a handheld flamer seems pretty effective. Yeah, and, and I had a, ha a handheld uh, flamer uh, um, which worked very nicely. Um, so there are different materials out there, and they have different concentrations of acetic acid. So the different concentrations of acetic acid would be applied at different rates, and they will you know, give you the rate uh, that, that they suggest. Um, uh, what we applied, uh, uh, we, we applied uh, with a little hand sprayer and um, I'm, I'm having a mental block at the moment on what material it was that we used. Um, uh, I believe that it was a 15% concentration of uh, acetic acid, uh, but that would be in, in the report. I can look that up. Uh, so that might be another one to uh, uh, to send me your email, and I'll I'll uh, I'll look that up for you. Uh, but basically, what we did is uh, you want to spray when the weeds are very small. It's very like flaming, uh, that you don't want the weeds to get too big. Um, although I will tell you of an experiment. Uh, when we were in, uh, when I was in Colorado, uh, we had some weeds uh, get away from us this summer, as I'm sure has never happened to anybody else on an organic farm. And so we went in with a rescue treatment. It was uh, in green onions. And we thought maybe we could get away with spraying over the top of the green onions uh, and not killing the green onions, but killing the annual weeds. And we did set the green onions back. I have some lovely photographs of that. But they came back and did uh, quite well. And we were able to, uh, surprisingly, uh, any of the uh, very you know young, succulent, uh, annual weeds, we managed to set them back uh, pretty heavily even when they were uh, uh, about uh, three inches, three to four inches tall and had um, uh, three to four sets of, of uh, true leaves. Hmm. Now, were there certain weeds that it controlled better than others? Yes. Uh, and um, I should have thought to throw that data in here, uh, but you know I didn't have enough room uh, at the moment. I can't think. Uh, well, you know, um, I need to write that up. I, uh, this will inspire me to write that up. That was just this summer, and I, I haven't gotten all of that uh, written up yet. We need to do it. Uh, we'll do another webinar. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's a question. Um, what was the name of the beetle um, that could be beneficial, possibly, for the removal of weed seeds? Oh, um, I, I, I've seen quite a bit of uh, literature, and, and Doug probably has too, uh, on the carabid, uh, C-A-R-A-B-I-D, carabid beetles uh, that uh, are actually removing weed seed from fields. And uh, here at Montana State University, Bruce Maxwell, has done some of that work. Doug, do you know anybody else? Um, I don't. I do know that in our systems, we're not all that excited about the generalist insect predators because we feel they are probably eating some of our more specific beneficial insects for our specific crops. So we tend to not like them so much. Yeah, and I didn't like them. Uh, well, I, I, I always liked them, but I didn't. I thought that our specific uh, parasites were going to be more important until we did our study, Doug, and I was really fascinated to see with all those larvae that we reared how little parasitism uh, that we saw, and yet we were getting control with our complex of generalist predators. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, we. Uh you know, we feel like we're really after some particular ones. It may have to do with just how quickly things explode down here and how long the season is, perhaps. Um, they just seem to overwhelm some of the generalists pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. OK, here's a different question. Um, where does Helen market her produce? 
Well, Helen uh, sold her farm last year, uh, and I sold the name and the place where, uh, and my farmer's market sites that I'd had for 17 years, uh, but the people that bought the farm were marketing uh, there uh, at the same place, and it is Missoula Farmer's Market, yay. And uh, then we also uh, used to wholesale uh, to uh, uh, wholesale places uh, uh, in, in uh, Missoula as well, but uh, a huge amount of it went to farmer's market, and hence I had a direct relationship with my clients, and uh, so my stuff maybe uh, could be, uh, you know, I could get away with a little bit of, uh, of injury on things uh, at farmer's market that uh, 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 wholesale uh, we couldn't get away with. Okay, um, we had two more questions about paper mulch, about what kind you use, and then also um, whether it also encourages slugs. Uh, well, I used uh, this uh, uh, paper mulch that was called Eco Cover, E C O dash C O V E R, Eco Cover. Uh, we we tried a whole bunch of other ones, and they would disintegrate in the field. Uh, over the years, the eco cover uh, lasted uh, throughout the whole season. It was very wonderful uh, that way. Uh, and, and I'm not going to say we didn't have slugs. When we did not mow uh, the living mulch, especially when we have the perennial uh, living mulch um, row centers, uh, we started getting slugs um, moving uh, moving into, uh, I'd never seen slugs uh, before, and so we, we got some slug. Uh, but if we kept the uh, living mulch mode, uh, we did not have a problem with them. And we did not see an increased problem with slugs in the paper mulch as long as we kept the row centers mode quite short, uh, uh, particularly if we were uh, irrigating overhead. But what Doug has just said I think is really important. Uh, you know, I, I'm in a very dry climate. And, and I, I think we clearly don't have the, the flood population that uh, others do in, in the United States. OK, thank you. Yeah, we have another comment um, related to carabid beetles for um, weed removal. Oh, good. Um, the comment is that um, Eric Gallant at the University of Maine did an interesting SARE final report on carabids for weed removal. And um, they were. Um, effective in one of three or four years. And then also Ed Peachy at Oregon State University has worked on this. So um, yeah, we can see if we can find those studies and um, maybe post them as links on the webinar page if we can locate them and they're publicly available. You know what, Alice? We'll Alex, that, yeah. just, mm -hmm. Alice, Alex just yesterday sent me um, Eric Gallant's study, and I haven't had a chance to read it yet. So, OK. okay. Uh, Alex has it. We'll get it up there. That's excellent. Oh, okay. Thank you so much for that yeah. comment. Yeah, yeah, that was from Alex, actually. Thank you. Alex. Oh, that was from Alex. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, hope she doesn't mind. Anyway, um, one, a few more questions we have time for. Um, uh, this one's for Doug um, about what he did to reduce the powdery mildew in his hoop house. Well, of course, I don't do anything because I'm just a consultant. OK, Doug, but, we're um, hearing you very quietly, if you wouldn't mind. just. Um. Um, I don't do anything because I'm just a consultant, but I did okay. perhaps give some advice to Phil, which he then did. Um, we seem to think there's, and there's been some reports of this, quite a relationship between soil water and powdery mildew that um, if you let them get too dry, the powdery mildew really does seem to get out of control. Um, so we manage the water carefully. We um, remove lower leaves as soon as they get infested. Um, we space our plants out quite a ways. Um, they're on 80-inch centers, uh, which is a long way apart for um, tomatoes. Um, let's see what else. Uh, they do get sprayed with um, sulfur on a schedule. Um, it seems like if you wait for the problem, you will never catch up to it. And um, venting the hoop houses seems to be really important um, to keep the humidities low. We open up the ends. Um, there's some varietal uh, things you can do. Certain varieties are less susceptible. Um, so yeah, a bunch of different things. They all seem to work together, and we seem to be able to keep it to a 
point where it's not a huge problem. But one of the real problems with powdery mildew seems to be that when it gets out of control, it results in fruit cracking. And so um, even though maybe your mildew isn't so bad, your fruit is cracked and unmarketable. Okay, thank you. We had another comment about another study. Um, Dr. Tony DeTomaso at Cornell University has also researched carabid beetles um, in corn and soybeans. So thank you very much for that comment as well. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, and if you have additional questions, as I mentioned, you can use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. Um, you know, Helen also gave you her website in case you want to contact her to get any of her studies. Um, let's see, here's a question, and one last one about the eco cover, whether it can be put down with a mulch um, layer without tearing. With lots Anybody of knows very, about that? With mm -hmm. lots of very bad language on <laughs> my part. Um, I, I found it very hard to put down uh, with my mulch layer. But Doug, I, I hear they're having better success in California using eco cover with equipment. Um, yeah, I wish I knew, but I don't. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we're pretty much out of time. I'd like to thank you so much, Helen and Doug, for giving this presentation, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.